I just want to thank you again. There's food there. We are doing this program and tonight it's called Wunderbar Together. And it is a national program that we're doing in collaboration with the World Affairs Councils of America. And um, we are just delighted that we have with us tonight, and I won't introduce him because he's had a full day and someone else will introduce him, but we're delighted to have the Consul General of the Federal Republic of Germany from New York, the New York Consulate, here with us tonight. And we're going to have a wonderful time engaging, questioning, talking, debating, and yes, you can disagree. All right. But with that, this is a night to celebrate Germany and Pennsylvania, as well as Germany and the United States. We have deep ties with Germany. And I'm going to tell you, you guys may be surprised, but you're not going to get any more avid fan of Germany than Joyce M. Davis. Because for eight years, I moderated a transatlantic forum of what? Young leaders. When I was young, I was one of the young leaders that interacted with young leaders in Germany. And it has left a lasting impression upon me the many summers I spent in Germany and interacting and debating with German young people and, and actually youth from throughout uh, Europe. So with that, part of what we want to do today is celebrate the German connection with uh, Pennsylvania. And there's no better organization that I would like to call forth than the Pennsylvania German Society. And we have the Vice President, Wayne Klein, here with us tonight. And he's going to come forward to let us know about Germany's influence in our, in our region. Please welcome him. Can everyone hear me? Most, most people tell me that I don't need a microphone. <laughs> um, my name is Wayne Klein. I'm soon to be the Vice President of the Pennsylvania German Society. Uh, the President, Tom Gerhardt, uh, who's been with the Society for many years, uh, was unable to attend and asked me to sit in. So I'm going to give uh, a, a brief overview of the Pennsylvania German Society and touch on the immigration, the early immigration of the Germans. Um, the Pennsylvania German Society was founded in uh, 1891, uh, approximately 200 years after the very first uh, immigration uh, wave came through in, in 1683. Um, that, that first wave settled in what is now Germantown, and it consisted of um, uh, between 1683 and 1776 uh, was a mixture of German, Swiss, and French Huguenots. As I said, the society was founded in 1891, um, about 200 years after the uh, first immigration, 1683, which settled in uh, roughly what the area that is now Germantown outside Philadelphia. Um, the first wave uh, between 1683 and roughly 1776 consisted of about uh, a, a mixture of Germans, Swiss, uh, and French Huguenots. The conditions in Germany at the time um, were such that, uh, particularly with the, the various religious groups, uh, there was a lot of discrimination and oppression. And uh, the Swiss were leaving Switzerland and coming into Germany and intermarrying. And the same with the French uh, Huguenots in the Alsace-Lorraine area. Um, that first wave uh, was about 70,000 uh, people, including wives and, and children. Um, after that first wave, there was another wave that ca came through, started around 1700, 1709, 1710. And it settled up the Hudson. Um, they had two camps, one on the east side of the Hudson and one on the west side. And a lot of the Germans settled there. Uh, one of my early relatives was one of the people that came through in 1709. Um, I also have a direct connection with the, uh, the later wave. My earliest ancestor, based on uh, very recent uh, research that I've done, was a uh, Johann Georg Klein who emigrated from a small village, uh, Ulmet, in the Pfalz uh, in 1738. And uh, he came in through the Port of Philadelphia and settled first in New Jersey. And a year later, he was recruited to become a minister in the German Baptist movement, which today is called the Church of the Brethren. 
which, which still exists. Um, he, uh, he moved to what is now Burnville and eventually became the first elder of the Little, little Swatara Church of the Brethren, which, which still exists today. Uh, the organizers of the original society um, were mainly city dwellers, uh, upper middle class professionals, and businessmen. Uh, the first annual meeting was held right here in Harrisburg on October 14th, uh, 1891. Uh, many of the elected board members, uh, however, were college graduates, many of them with doctorates. And this uh, academic background proved to be very critical in establishing the goals of the society, uh, which are to preserve and promote the history, the culture, uh, the religious background, and the dialect of the Pennsylvania Germans. Uh, the traditional native uh, language called colloquially uh, Pennsylvania Dutch, or as they would say, Pennsylvanisch Deutsch, uh, is a mixture of the various dialects. Um, the, uh, the Germans came from various areas in German, and uh, before, before the German language came to be, uh, with Martin Luther, I believe it was, um, Germany was just a mixture of city-states and dialects. Um, uh, on another personal note, uh, one of my relatives, a Reverend John Jacob Klein, was an early uh, member who was, who was elected to the society in 1900. Uh, today the society has about a thousand members in 44 U.S. states and three countries, Canada, Germany, and Austria. Uh, roughly 6% of the American population today, which amounts to about 20 million people, has either paternal or maternal Pennsylvania Dutch ancestry, not just German, Pennsylvania Dutch. Um, I, I often get a kick out of when I hear this commercial on, uh, on television about the Ancestry.com. Please sign up and you'll be surprised at what your ancestry is. Um, no question for me. All four sides, German. <laughs> <laughs> Slam dunk. <laughs> um, the publication of journals and books uh, was also an important goal of the society. Uh, the minutes of its meetings and historical studies that were done of interest to its members were published as proceedings and uh, addresses. Uh, more or less annually from 1891 until about 1966. Um, my, my relative, uh, 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 Reverend Klein, uh, was the pastor of the New Hanover Lutheran Church in Montgomery County. He wrote a history of that church and that was published in the 1909 volume 20 of the Society Proceedings. Um, also, the Society has uh, com uh, published commissioned books on some aspect of Pennsylvania German culture every year since 1891. Uh, the yearly book is distributed to all members at the annual meeting of the Society, which are usually held at various churches uh, of the early denominations, Lutheran, Reformed, Moravian, and German Baptist, today the Church of the Brethren. Um, this is an example of one of the one of the books that has been published in the past, and we are presenting this as a gift to the Council General. It's called. It's, it's called Die Pansylvanische Deutsch by Thank you. by Earl C. Haig, who was a professor, uh, studied. Uh, University of Heidelberg in Germany, and has published uh, quite a lot of uh, books on uh, Pennsylvania D Dutch. Great, thank you. Um, in addition, uh, the Society also publishes a journal, Der Regeboga, The Rainbow, and a newsletter, S. Elbedrich. We don't have enough time for me to explain to you what, uh, what an Elbedrich is. <laughs> no. Um, a couple of interesting notes. Um, there were three governors of Pennsylvania 
who have served as president of the Pennsylvania German Society, Samuel W. Pennypacker, Martin Grove Brumbaugh, who was uh, Church of the Brethren, and James Adams Beaver. And as a final note, um, President Dwight Eisenhower, although never having been president of the society, um, was purebred Pennsylvania Dutch, both sides of the family. Uh, one of the family's early homesteads was near the present town of Myerstown, about 30 miles east of here. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. That's enough. <laughs> Well, that was a wonderful history. I hope you now can go back and tell your, your colleagues that uh, there are very strong and enduring ties here. But that's the theme of, our, of tonight. And it's ties that bind, strengthening the transatlantic partnership. That's, that's what we're about. And so we'll move now right into the reason we're here in this lovely um, the lobby area of Temple University Harrisburg is because of the support and generosity of Temple University. It provides offices for the World Affairs Council of Harrisburg, and we always have a place to hold our events, uh, thanks to uh, their understanding of the importance of what we do in our community. So with that, I want to invite a board member and the director of Temple University Harrisburg, Link Martin, to come forward so he will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Joyce. You know, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have everyone here this evening. Uh, Temple University tries to engage the community, open ourselves up to discussion of important topics, and there's nothing more important these days than international issues, uh, both um, how things are changing and how things we would like them to be. It's important that we look towards building those connections at a person-to-person -person level even at times if our governments can't quite agree on things um, we can and we should continue to do that um, my connection with germany is somewhat loose i do not have a uh, heritage uh, in terms of german background in college i took one semester of german uh, the instructor agreed to pass me if i would not sign up for another semester <laughs> So I had a limited exposure to the language. But I had uh, a fortunate time in the last few years. I, for about 10 years, I took a group of students from Temple uh, during the summer for an exchange program with the University of Applied Sciences in Erfurt, Germany. We'd come and stay. Um, it was a wonderful visit each year. Uh, we learned a lot. I was accused of going every year for the beer and sausage, but it really was an amazing visit each year, and I have some very good friends in Erfurt that I was fortunate to acquire through that program. What reinforced to me at that time was the kindness and the commitment to social justice of the German people that I met, both the faculty, the students, the interest in the world, and that really helped our students take a broader view of social issues. We visited a variety of social service agencies, including shelters and programs serving migrant families, and the discussion of how a society accepts new people was very valuable for our discussions. Tonight, we're very fortunate. You know, the Consul General, David Gill of New York, is here to speak with us. He was born in what is former East Germany and grew up in a very different environment. He was not allowed to go to the university and uh, was able later to join uh, through a Protestant school to gain an education and to go to uh, a variety of paths that led him, after being a plumber for a while, left him into uh, higher education and acquired a law degree, not only attending law school in Berlin, but also in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania. He's very instrumental in the transition period, and his resume is amazing. His work with Citizens Committee in the um, 
transfer the um, change around the Stasi and the other governmental agencies from East Germany and how the, the truth and reconciliation, the looking at public records was a very important transition during that time. He's served in a variety of posts, including working with the Council of the Protestant Church in Germany. He's worked for the German president, and now for the last three years, two years, has been Council General in New York. One of the things I noticed in his resume was receiving the Theodore Hess Medal in 1991, which I, I wasn't familiar with. And, but I looked it up, and it's, it's really a no, recognition of individuals who are committed to democracy, to social justice, and to civil society, and people who have helped promote that in Germany and internationally. So that, that's an amazing award that uh, we should understand. Uh, you did an internship. You were in the U.S. Congress uh, as an intern for a short period of time. Um, that didn't scare you away from being coming back to the U.S., so that's good. But uh, I'm, we're very fortunate that Mr. Gill is here to speak with us and share his wealth of knowledge uh, with us this evening. So, Council General Gill, welcome. Thank you, Professor Martin, for this kind introduction. Actually, you, when you go to Erfurt, to Thuringia, that's the part of Germany where you get the best Bratwurst. Thuringer Bratwurst. It's the best <laughs> Bratwurst ever. And the Bavarian Nuremberg thinks different, but I, I think Thuringer Bratwurst is really good. <laughs> However, it's a great, great pleasure and honor and joy to be with you tonight. And I'm happy to be finally in Harrisburg. I'm uh, Council General already for uh, two years in New York and I didn't make it to Harrisburg yet but now I'm here I had a wonderful day already very impressed by this beautiful capital you have in this uh, beautiful city uh, we met together with my colleague Heiko Schwarz met interesting people interesting and interested in German-American relationship I saw a little bit of this uh, beautiful city and I was stunned by when when we drove over the river I thought that's Florence <laughs> I mean you have a river it's a little bigger than the Arno River you have a lot of bridges it's like in Venice and you have a dome in the city so this was my connection I'm, I'm not sure if I'm the only one who uh, discovered this but so when I think of Harrisburg in the future, I think of Florence. And by the way, the, the hills around, it's like Florence. I've, <laughs> uh, when you have been there, then you feel at home. Thank you, Joyce, for um, organizing this evening. And indeed, uh, this evening is part of a program the foreign ministry in Germany organized for the whole year. We call it the Deutschlandjahr, the year of German-American friendship and it has a title you need the title somehow wunderbar together yes i think we are better off when we are together and that's the message of this uh, deutschland year this year of german american friendship um, we want to focus on our relationship and we want to focus not only in the regions where much of um, exchange is going on anyway i know Harrisburg belongs to this with the World Affairs Council, but we uh, go also in other states and we want to talk with the American people about uh, what is the foundation of our relationship and why it's so important that we stick together, Americans and Germans. And that is one reason why I'm here in uh, Harrisburg and why I like to travel around in my district. Uh, Pennsylvania is a um, model state for German-American relationship. You just heard it in Wayne Klein's um, um, presentation how strong the ties to Germany are. Um, I traveled Pennsylvania already several times and I try always to look at the German heritage in Pennsylvania but also uh, look in the present German representation here in this uh, country. A lot of German companies are active in 
in Pennsylvania. There are Pennsylvanian companies active in Germany. And so that's what I really like in my job, um, traveling around my um, district, learning about America and talking about Germany. Because that's sometimes I'm asked, what are you doing as Consul General? Uh, what is your job? Are you a small ambassador or are you just a branch office on, of the embassy in Washington? And I always say neither nor. I'm independent. I have my district. I, I want to foster German-American relationship. And if you want to describe it very briefly, what we do, me and my colleagues in the consulate in New York, uh, then there are three tasks we have. Of course, the consulate generals are general um, serving the Germans in this uh, um, in our district, and also those people who want to travel to Germany or to Europe and need some paper for this. So we issue passports and we issue visas. That's the ground foundation of each council general in the world. But then there are two additional tasks we have. And if you want to describe it very briefly, it's explaining Germany and trying to understand America. Um, that's our job. And you can't do this from a nice office overlooking the East River in, uh, <laughs> River in New York. You really have to travel to talk to these people. And since I like to network, um, I like this job and I like <laughs> to be here with you tonight. Um, today I, I'm, I'm the one who uh, might explain something, but I also want to uh, engage with you and to listen to you what's important for you here in this region and what's important for you when you uh, uh, talk and think about the German-American relationship. By the way, my district is, we have a lot of consul generals and consulate generals in, in, in America. My district is the great state of Pennsylvania, then New Jersey and the state of New York, plus an um, exotic addition, it's the island of Bermuda. Uh, this is also my district. So I have been there um, in January, it was very nice. Uh, even there are some Germans uh, who need some services, but usually uh, uh, honorary council uh, serves the Germans in Bermuda. I was asked to talk a little bit about the state of the transatlantic relationship. And when we talk about the transatlantic relationship, then we have to talk about the past. Because our transatlantic relationship relies very much on common experiences, good and not so good experiences, and a, a very strong relationship which developed over the last now more than 70 years. When we talk about our relationship, then we talk um, about the time after the incredible or the greatest catastrophe you could imagine, World War II and the Holocaust, and the incredible development we experienced as Germans, as Europeans, but particularly as Germans, that the Americans, after all this death of civilians, soldiers, and the European Jews, were willing to reach out for reconcilia reconciliation and even much more, the Americans helped us, the Germans, who brought so much um, atrocity in this world, to rebuild our country. And not only to rebuild this country, but also to help us to re-enter the democratic, the free world. And um, I can assure you that the West majority in Germany is well aware of uh, this history and this is still and will be a strong foundation and a driving force for our relationship with this, which is with all disagreements and hiccups we, uh, we, 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 we see in the moment is a very strong relationship. Yes, the Americans enabled us to become what I would say an anchor state of the Western world. Uh, since you taught us 
important values of freedom and democracy. And yes, that's also not forgotten. forgotten. The United States also protected at least one part of Germany against threats from outside. In the times of the East-West confrontation and different conflicts, West, Ger West Berlin, but also West Germany, it was extremely important for uh, the Germans in the Western part of the country to know that they can rely on the protection of the American people. And this is also a time of um, very special, very unique ties. All these servicemen, all these GIs who came over to Germany, who served in Germany um, alone or with their family, or they came alone and went back uh, together with a, a newly wed wife. Um, today alone, I, I met two people who told me they, they went to, to, to Germany and they came home with a wife. Um, and so these, these are very, very important ties. And uh, I always, when I meet uh, former GIs who spent one, two or three years in Germany, they usually have very fond um, memories, not only because of bratwurst and beer, but also of the community they lived in. And that makes me, of course, very happy. So obviously, our ties are not only um, economic ties. It's not only business. Even so, I met several uh, business organizations today. We talked about uh, businesses, we talked about tariffs and uh, free trade, but we all also talked about the other important parts of our relationship. Democracy, the rule of law, human rights and human dignity, and of course the freedom in uh, the freedoms in all its colors we, the people, know. Since this is such a special foundation, um, I'm not worried about our foundation, even so something is a little, little bit uh, diff uh, difficult in the moment. But after what um, Professor um, Martin told about my, my, uh, my biography, you might understand that, that I'm very keen to foster this relationship because I experienced what it means to grow up not in a society which is free, in a society where the democratic and uh, civil rights are, uh, the people are deprived of these rights. And um, we know, uh, and not only, I know in this room there are different people who have an, uh, a similar experience uh, from mostly Eastern uh, Europe. When you know that this is not just given, you might defend it much more, and that's why I see it also as my uh, job as a um, consul general, really to to werben, to to advocate um, these values and to advocate our relationship which can be uh, a guarantee for uh, these values. Um, because um, that was something I um, experienced when I served the former president of Germany, Joachim Gauck. He, was, uh, he served as president of Germany from 2012 to 2017, and I had the honor to be his uh, chief of staff. He, is a little bit older than I am, but he has a similar um, um, experience. He was a Protestant minister in East Germany as well. And he really preached very authentically the values of democracy, freedom, rule of law. Um, and uh, this is convincing when people who enjoy these freedoms tell about these freedoms. And I mean all of us, Americans as Germans as well. Well, um, I don't have to tell you anything about my biography anymore. You did already. Um, maybe, maybe one little addition. Even though I... Um, grew up in East Germany behind the Iron Curtains and 
for the first time that I went on the west side of the Berlin Wall, even so I lived in Berlin in the late 80s, was after n November 9th when the wall came down. So I was um, somehow imprisoned. We could travel the southeastern part of, of, of Europe to Bulgaria, Hungary, Romania, but not on the western part. But even though I was behind these iron curtains, there was one uh, town or city in Pennsylvania I had a very um, a strong relationship um, because I met people from this town and I somehow felt connected to this uh, town and that is Bethlehem in Pennsylvania. Not far from here, uh, the Moravian settlement and not all of you might know where the name Moravians comes from. Of course it comes from Moravia but the church, the Moravian church was not founded in Romania it was founded in the east of Saxony, um, close to the Polish and Czech border, uh, founded by refugees from Romania and Bohemia, Protestants who fled the counter-reformation in the early 18th century. And this little town they founded in the east of Saxony is called Hernhut under the protection of the Lord. That's the meaning of, the, of this uh, city's, um, thank you, this city's name. And uh, those people went out in the world to, as missionaries. So in some of them, my spiritual ancestors came to Pennsylvania. Count Sinzendorf came to Germantown first um, to meet uh, Pennsylvanian Dutch, probably. <laughs> and uh, then he, he went uh, to the Poconos and 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 talked to the uh, to the um, uh, Native Americans. And on Christmas Day of 1741, they founded Bethlehem in Pennsylvania. So, and since my little town, the Moravian Church is a small Protestant church um, spread over the world, Caribbean. Um, um, India, Africa, whatever. And even in East Germany, behind the Iron Curtains, Hernhut, this little town where I grew up, was kind of a mecca of the, of the, of the Moravians. So we were lucky to meet people from all over the world, which was not very common in East Germany because it was behind a pretty well-guarded um, uh, fence. So that's my connection to my early connection uh, to, to Pennsylvania. When I was in second grade, um, I, I wore a t-shirt Moravian College. <laughs> <laughs> so, and of course, the other connection is Philadelphia. I loved to live in Philadelphia 20 years ago when I had the chance uh, to study in Philadelphia for one year at a law school, a UPenn law school. So, let's go back to the transatlantic relationship. Um, to state one thing very clear, the US is and will be the most important partner of Germany outside of the European Union. There is no question, and I can't imagine any different development than this. We are close for historic reasons, but also for um, very current reasons and also for economic reasons. And when I talk about Germany, then you always have, uh, has, uh, you always have to hear uh, also Europe, because particularly in the field of the economy, but also in other political fields, we are not just Germany, we are Europe. And we talked about this question of trade deals. Um, President Trump, Trump wants with, uh, want to have, wants to have with, with Germany or Italy or France bilateral. No, the bilateral trade deals are American Europeans. There is no way around this. That's how we are organized in Europe and that's why when I talk about Germany there's a lot of Europe as well in, in this. So what I, what I stated, the United States will always be our most important partner and that's not different um, even this times. But of course our relationship have seen uh, better days. That is not a, not a secret 
And we work on this to make it better, to make it more smooth. And there are a lot of connections on the personal level, um, but also in negotiations, etc. So, what is so different? First of all, um, I think there is a personal reason behind this. Um, we had all the years since the Second World War, uh, at least in the first time with West Germany and then with the whole of Germany, a lot of personal ties of the acting politicians on both sides. There were these young leader, leaders' conferences. Uh, there are still young leaders' conferences, but much less than in former times, because over decades, the transatlantic relationship was the corner relationship in foreign policy. That changed, of course. So the energy went in different directions. So these pers personal ties with young leaders, with people who studied on the other side of the, uh, of the, of the Atlantic, um, with people who served as, as GIs in, 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 in Germany, um, as German soldiers trained in the United States. That changed very much and, and uh, we never had an, ad an administration in, in Washington which, which where the percentage of people who, uh, who had experienced the importance of transatlantic relationship was so small. And this is, this is uh, a fact. I don't blame anybody about this, but this m makes um, um, this makes obvious that it is important to invest in personal relationship. So every exchange program we have, we have to support students who come here, politicians who go to Germany, um, civil servants who, who have exchange about environmental issues, about uh, whatever, infrastructure, whatever, personal exchange is the most important foundation of good relationships. But of course there is another um, change and that is the very different approach of uh, to foreign policy of the two administrations in Washington and Berlin. President Trump and Secretary Pompeo follow their policy America first. That's their good right, when they think that's the right approach to polit poly foreign politics, let them do. It's different from the German. So they put their national interest in the focus, and sometimes this is the only focus they have in foreign policy. There's this idea that alli alliances of states like the European Union are rather harmful for the members than helpful. I can only say if we wouldn't have had the European Union over the last more than 50 years, when was it? 55, I think, so 60, 60 years, um, Europe, Europe would look different economically, politically. We didn't have a, a real war between countries since the Second World War in Europe. Um, Beside all the economic problems, Europe is economically uh, developed in a way nobody would have expected. Portugal, Greece, countries who, from their own, own uh, with their own uh, resources, wouldn't have been where they are uh, now. With all the problems, I know, and I don't want to say everything is fine with the European Union, but I'm convinced. Um, um, international alliances or land alliances of states are mostly helpful. And of course, um, President Trump and Secretary Pompeo follow um, unilateral agenda. Partners are included when it seems help helpful for their own interests, but if it doesn't look helpful, then partners are sometimes let's say, neglected. The approach of the um, German foreign minister and the chancellor is a very different one. We 
advocate very clearly and strongly for multilateral cooperation and solution funding. Germany invests heavily also in international collaboration, and not only in the European Union, but much further. Uh, in free trade and open borders, it's much as possible. And I have to admit, we still have to learn something in this field. Germany was rather um, hesitant to take the lead in foreign policy regarding our history. But um, now we are in the process where Germany is a very, um, it's a, stronger, a strong country and it enjoys a lot of trust. And we have to use this for the better, not only of our country. We also invest, invest in the United Nations with all its problems because we are convinced that the United Nations are, would have been to invent if, if they wouldn't exist in the moment. With all the problems, with all the bias in certain countries and um, you can question how they deal with Israel, how they deal with the human rights, but they it's at least there is a forum of all the countries in this world where you can speak with each other. Not all the results might be fit, and uh, if you are there, if you work there as a diplomat, it's not just enjoyable. It's frustrating in many things, but in many ways, but it's important to have this organization. And in a moment, um, Germany is even. That's nothing special for you as American. Americans, but for us it's German, it's German that is. Uh, we are a member of the Security Council for two years and we want to uh, support um, um, a better protection of humita humanitarian aid workers. We support certain peace missions. Germany is responsible for sanctions regarding North Korea, Sudan, um, two or more, more countries or regions with a lot of conflicts. And what's also very important for the German foreign policy it's, uh, are the women's rights. The Chancellor, Chancellor Merkel, described the guideline for our foreign politics in Davos as follows. You need to factor in the interest of others when, you define, when we define our own national interests. And she said, global architecture can only work when all are ready to compromise. That's the guideline of our foreign policy. Having said all of this, of course, um, the relationship between our countries and the importance of the uh, transatlantic relationship it changed not just two years ago. I talked about this briefly. There was already a shift when the world became more complex, when there were uh, developed more um, power centers than Europe and America. And that won't change. We won't have the good old times, but I think we are better off together. Let me just, I don't know how, did, how we are in time. Should I? Yeah, we're gonna have questions, so go. Should I yeah. quickly, i wrap it up. But I, 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 I want to address at least some um, obvious disagreements, just to mention them. Um, of course, one obvious disagreement is how to deal with Iran. We Germans and Europeans want to keep Iran in the GCPOA, GCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Why do we want the, there? Because we want to prevent Iran from resuming its nuclear power. And there you have to give something. That's the ratio why this um, plan of action, this treaty was worked out over, over almost a decade. And uh, that's why all those uh, who were involved uh, were so happy that it was possible to do. Yes, we know 
nothing less and nothing more we can achieve with this, uh, this treaty, only to prevent the Iran from resuming its nuclear power. It's not the solution for all problems. Of course, we see in Germany the harmful role Iran plays in the Middle East, and our foreign minister just went to Tehran this weekend, unfortunately not very successful in pushing the Iran to stick to what they agreed to. And it's not so easy to push somebody what he agreed to when the other side can deliver the way it was planned to. The view of the White House and the State Department is a different one. Um, they view Iran's destructive and dangerous behavior in the region. They see the missile program and the sunset, sunset clause as a much bigger risk and withdrew from the agreement. You know about all of this. And now we are in a harsh debate. What does it mean? Um, um, not only does one part of the treaty uh, withdraw, withdrew, but it also expects that the others who are still convinced that this treaty is better than nothing also withdraw with, with, with and, um, and reinvent sanctions. And that's a new quality also of relationship between our countries, that Washington tells Europe you have to do that or we, have, we sanction you not only the Iran, but you. Second issue, the NATO. We are committed, the Americans, even so in the beginning one could, um, uh, could get the impression that um, the president wasn't so sure that NATO is really the alliance for the future. I think that's very clear, but we have some disagreements of different approaches to the burden sharing. President um, Trump had a point when he says the Europeans, the Germans, have to do more for the protection and for supporting uh, protection of the Western world and for supporting NATO. Um, and yes, it is difficult to explain that when the NATO uh, states agreed to um, use, they didn't, they didn't, I think, did they agree about a year? No, they just uh, agreed about 2% uh, of the GDP um, should, be, should be used for, uh, for, um, for, the, for the defense budget. We are, to be open and frank, far away from that. We are, um, not even at 1.5%, but we are working on it. It's not that um, um, we don't want to spend more. There are political factions. They are very clear that they don't want to spend more. But in general, there is an awareness in the political class in Germany that we have to do more. This was a discussion which started already um, five years ago. My president our president, my president, gave important impulse to this uh, political discussion at the Munich uh, Security Conference in 2014 that we have to do more, that we have to be um, faster and um, more, let's say, resolute. What's the? Resolute. Resolute. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, however, we already um, spent within 10 years 80 percent more for the um, for the defense budget, but it will still uh, take a while. And when you have a healthy economy, which grows, um, then the GDP grows, and um, even so, you have 80 percent more than 10 years ago. You are still not. Um, um, uh, 1.9 percent, but still 1.6. So we work on this. This is um, something we have to do uh, some more homework. There's another disagreement. That's the Nord Stream to the gas pipeline from Russia to Germany. 
let's say, from Russia to Europe, but I want to explain this. Very in interesting for you from Pennsylvania. You are by now the biggest producer. Are you the biggest producer of, of uh, natural gas in the, in the United States, at least by fracking, I guess. So, um, but that's not the argument the administration in Washington has. The argument of the administration in Washington is that this gas pipeline makes Germany a hostage, a political hostage of Russia. Um, we see it, you won't be uh, surprised, a little bit different. Um, over the last years, um, we invested, not only Germany, but Europe in general, invested heavily in the connection uh, of energy supplies in Europe. You can pump gas and oil, it's mostly gas by now, from north to south, from west to east, and vice versa. And in the end, um, a dependency from some gas supplier um, is a question of the alternatives. And uh, I think um, Germany and uh, the European Union worked uh, intensively to diverse the supply. So not to depend on one uh, um, supplier alone. In addition, we invest a lot in the renewable uh, energy. Germany is now by a third of our energy is already renewable. So that's a big achievement, but we have to be uh, quicker. So there is a obvious uh, disagreement to Nord Stream 2. One can argue is it politically wise to do these uh, businesses with Russia? Um, I think, um, but this is not a question of a, of a political hostage. And there will be a disagreement. And we make sure that we are not just thinking about our energy um, uh, security, but also the security of our uh, neighboring European um, states. And of course, there is the issue of the trade. Um, uh, President Trump had very successfully, um, I think, established the story of the big surplus of the German exports to the United States. Um, and he's right when you talk about uh, uh, the uh, trade surplus solely um, looking at the trade of goods. So things you can take into the hand. But there's another part of international trade, that's the trade of services. And you might be aware of the fact that the big internet uh, companies are not German companies or European companies, they are American. Google, Amazon, uh, you name them all. And the businesses and the money they make in Europe is uh, um, way more than European businesses uh, make in service trade with the United States. So when you put both together, and that's the, uh, that's the uh, real issue of international trade, then we are pretty much even. In addition, um, not every German product is really manufactured in Germany. Um, I don't know if you know that the biggest plant BMW built, ha has built, is not in Bavaria. It's in South Carolina, in Spartanburg. And every X model, BMW X model, which drives through the world in Beijing, Moscow, Johannesburg, um, New York, or Munich <laughs> is built in the United States. So this makes, first of all, makes, uh, 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 tells you the story about um, that Germany is also investing, or German companies are investing here in the United States. They, 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 they provide jobs. German companies are responsible for about 707,000 uh, jobs in the United States. For instance, in Bethlehem, we have the B. Brown, big uh, medical supplier, pharmaceutical uh, company, 
1,800 employees and they just um, built an addition for another 1,000 employees. So, but it shows also how interconnected we are. And that's not so easy just to disrupt this um, flow of goods and ideas and um, yeah, um, trade. So we have to discuss these, these differences. I don't tell you them to uh, tell you about them to, to um, um, yeah, in order to 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 uh, paint a dark picture. No, I just uh, want to let you know that we have issues to talk about, and I'm very sure uh, that it's, that we will resolve them for the good of both of our countries. First of all, because we are interconnected, it is, uh, it is um, important. And second of all, this leads me back to my uh, uh, earlier remarks. We should stick together because the international geopolitical and strategic landscape is changing. There's the rise of China at a pace unprecedented in history and not long, China's economy will be the largest in the world. We see China accumulating all over the world economic and political assets that it will use, that's for sure. Look at Africa, uh, but not only in Africa, also in Europe, very strategically um, economic power which will change into into political power and um, China is also using propaganda in a very interesting way. I just yesterday read an article in the Spiegel, in the, the German news magazine, about the China um, state television which is really serving now parts of Africa um, similar to Russia today. Uh, 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 state state TV. So we have Russia returning as a military power using means of asymmetric cyber warfare for geopolitical gains. And of course we still face the Islamist militancy. And uh, even so ISIS may have largely been beaten. This problem um, I'm very sure is not not gone yet. Unfortunately, too many people speak the violent and anti-Western and hate-filled language of extremism. So, we have to stand together, and we will stand together, not only in defending our democracies and free societies, but also in confronting these threats. I should say at the end uh, something more positive, I think. It's not, it, it, no, don't understand me wrong. I, it's it's not, uh, not negative what I said. I just want to make you aware at, uh, about the state of the transatlantic relationship. But what is really important also for my job, um, um, explaining Germany, but the other part was trying to understand America. And that's not just for me. That's my job to translate it to the German politicians, but also to the German people and my German friends and my visitors, um, that America is very different from what you could imagine when you just read the newspapers and just read about the problems. And that's why I like so much to go into my district, because you, you, you get another another image and you uh, look differently to this country and uh, that's why it's so important that um, organizations like the World Affairs Council here foster this exchange. We have to meet each other, we have to look deeper to the other country to get our own idea and then we will see there's so much, there are so much, so many resources so much sympathy, so much interest that we shouldn't be worried about our relationship. But we have to invest it and we have to be interested in each other. But that's what my experience is when I travel around. There is a lot of um, interest and sympathy and that makes me very um, optimistic. Thank you so much.
I don't know if this is working or not, but you have to stay right here you, because no, no, this, this okay, because you have to stay here because part of what we like to do as a World Affairs Council is grill the speaker. <laughs> we ask questions. And I'll start while you guys are getting your thinking caps on. You did say earlier, and I mean you you've been you're a diplomat, so you've been very diplomatic. And I thank you for that. You've been I haven't kind. Been a diplomat you have been very kind. Well, you are now. But you did tell me that um, Germans are very worried. The German people are very worried about Americans and where America is going. And I heard today something that also struck me when we were at the World Trade Center, I believe, or at the uh, Tina is here. We started there for lunch and then we went to the Pennsylvania Chamber. And they said our allies, even countries such as Canada, are heartbroken. They feel personally hurt because we consider them a threat. So while there always have been problems between countries, that's just the way it is in the world, is there something different now that makes you even more concerned? Which is why you're here trying to reach out to your friends. <coughs> so what is interesting, um, oh, let's start different. To form your own image of another country, you usually, as, much, uh, as long as you are not able to live there or have relatives or friends, you usually rely on the media. And um, you, when you rely on the media, you usually get only a part of what this country is about. And um, that's how the media works. Um, the media writes about the problems and uh, what important and powerful people do. And so when you look at the image the United States had over the last decades, it also, uh, it always mirrors the, um, the fondness of the Germans uh, of the current president. So um, the Germans had a not so good um, impression of America during the presidency of George W. Bush, particularly after he invented Iraq. And this was more uh, um, a difference in the political approach and um, Germans are r rather hesitant in using power, um, military power. Um, Americans are traditionally more willing and thank God sometimes. <laughs> um, so, but the image was not very good. It was seen as um, going to war in the way it shouldn't be. And um, so then came Obama, who was uh, well beloved in Germany, and the image of America went up. Um, even though Obama in his first years was not a particularly close friend to the Germans. He looked to Asia, he didn't have the relationship to Angela Merkel of the last years. Uh, but it was his person who shaped the view Germans had of the United States. Now it's uh, President Trump, who is, if I see it right, even in this country very disputed about. And in Germany, you, and this is different from, from Bush. I mean, he talked about the new Europe and the old Europe, yes. But it was not this direct expectations or even threats against partners, which makes the difference and the view people have of America difference. Even though um, they didn't change so much so far, not even in trade. Uh, but uh, uh, Germans look at America um, through, this, through this lens and forget what's around us. And that's why that's what I said in the end of my presentation. That's why it's so important to transport to the Germans. Uh, the tariffs is not really that was the, what the Americans um, 
um, care about so much in their daily life and not even not even so much also in the relationship to Germany and yes of course it is uh, puzzling and worrying uh, when you read in the newspaper that, that German cars are a threat for the for the for the American security <laughs> because that that should be the the reasoning uh, for for tariffs on German German cars um, and this is puzzling I think not not so heartbroken like for the for the Canadians who right. who traditionally were much closer to you mm -hmm. um, than than we Germans or Europeans are. But this is something what worries the Germans, that's that or the Europeans. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that's why we have to connect. Okay. Other questions? Yes. So I'll start with that. So uh, EU and uh, US started like a decade and a half ago or so, the transatlantic uh, trade and investment partnership discussions, which uh, was very close. It was a, like a decade and a half talks and it was going to be the biggest uh, trade partnership of the world. And starting January 20, 2017, everything dropped. I mean, it was, it was uh, attacked hard. I mean, it was main attacks were from left, actually unions before. But now with uh, Trump and uh, the current administration, it was totally dropped. Now, my question is, is that totally dropped from EU or is it something that's going to be in the books? Especially given uh, the, the trend that's in Europe also with, uh, with the new right-wing party. I mean, extreme, not um, mainstream right and left, but... Uh, Ver kind of version America first, but Italy has one, Austria and Viktor Orban and everybody else in, in EU that's pushing. Okay, that's the answer. Right. My country is my country, my interest is my interest. That's kind of a long question, but. So, um, yes, you are right. It was uh, this T T TTIP uh, negotiations were pretty far uh, they, they could have I mean this was the goal to 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 close them uh, still during the presidency of, of, of Barack Obama uh, but of course in Germany in Europe in general there were, was a lot of protests and and fears that the standards for certain food or whatever wouldn't fit our standards and vice versa and so we we would uh, would get um, yeah we, we so um, uh, our standards would be lowered etc etc and that was uh, even even work standards um, wage standards etc all this would have been part of this agreement um, from nowadays from, from from now you would wish for something like this because it would have helped to to ease uh, the, the, the trade between Europe and the US tremendously. I don't know if it would have lasted, um, you never know, um, but um, I don't see that a new TTIP will, will, uh, will be negotiated in the next two years. No, I don't see it, um, not, not on the European side, but also not at the American side. And it, the, the right extremists don't play the big role in this. I think in the moment, nobody can imagine it. So let's take two quick questions here and Keith. Uh, this is a sophisticated group. This is a well-traveled group. This is, this is probably group. a well-heeled <laughs> well group uh, in comparison to other people out in the street here. Um, and they have had a different kind of experience with education than what students are having in this country now. And I can't imagine what the German students are having in, this country, in their country because I don't know enough about education. What could be done in your view? I mean, and it's got to be very far down into second grade or something like that to help students understand different cultures. What, what? Can be done to what help? is the different experience? Well, in kids? I mean, right now, I think that American <laughs> students, so the experts say, have a very uh, poor understanding of world affairs. 
that there are people, of course, there are people in some schools that are extremely well educated. They're well educated in literature and in foreign languages. But well, there is the mass of people have very little knowledge of the world outside of their own backyard, so to speak. And what about German students? Can it be said the same thing? Are, are most of the German students not as well educated as you would like them to be in world affairs? Uh, what, I was wondering if you could talk about some of the recent success, relative success of the AFD in Germany and uh, whether or not you see any parallels between those groups and, and what has happened in the United States or do you see these as totally disconnected political uh, issues? And the second one, if you, if you want to go for it, is you, you started out with the foundation and what the United States has taught Germany. And I wanted to turn that around and you, you talked about reconciliation, uh, I guess both between East and West Germany and also Germany facing its, uh, its Second World War past. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that process and what the United States could learn from Germany's confrontation with its past because um, I'm pretty convinced that the United States has historical amnesia as far as the racism that has occurred in our country. Um, um, who I am uh, to teach you anything, and I'm not an expert in education. I think it's uh, in some ways very natural that a bigger country uh, has a lot of issues within the country than smaller countries. I mean, the Dutch all speak English and German and Dutch and uh, French because they are so small they have to look around. Americans don't have to look around so much. Uh, having said this, uh, I think it's better for your own life when you know more of what's going around the world and maybe from Pennsylvania you can also look to, 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 to California or whatever. Um, <laughs> so the German school system is not perfect um, and uh, not in every school you learn a lot of, a lot of about uh, global politics. But uh, what is I think different uh, to the United States is that uh, learning a language is part in elementary school. You start usually with a foreign language, which uh, has what, with the class in? Third, third grade. And when you go to high school, you have at least two, two foreign languages. That already broadens the view. Mm -hmm. Um, to be fair, it's easier to travel in, 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 in Europe to other countries than in the United States. And uh, so you are closer there. I don't know, I, I, I don't know what it is. We don't have these huge differences between private schools and public schools. We have public schools with problems, particularly in neighborhoods where you have a high percentage of, of my migrants, where the German language is a problem in school, um, but we don't have so many private schools, and we don't have this kind of tuitions. Point. That's that makes a big difference. Um, but if you ask my mother, she would say the youth of today doesn't know what we knew. <laughs> uh, of course, there is there are other other things they learn in school. But yes, education system is, is always an issue. And that's why every government which comes new in, in the government wants to change everything, which is not very wise, I think. Um, and I, I'm not sure that it's really, really, I shouldn't say this, I'm a diplomat, and I don't know why I say this, but it's also uh, difficult if you, I, I was told in, I, I went to Brooks County, and they told me they have, is it possible, 15 school districts, and each is governed by another, yeah. in, uh, including yeah. the curricula? Yeah, oh yeah. There's no unified curriculum, that's the problem. And that's yeah. difficult. Yeah. But I don't know if this is the reason. And of course, um, education is everything. Not everything, but it makes a big difference. And I, I, I learned today that uh, if I buy Hershey chocolate, then people in Harrisburg will be uh, schooled. 
<laughs> so, good. The other, um, yes, I didn't talk about the AFD. Um, that's a new development, not so new anymore, but um, it took almost 70 years until uh, right wing, it's not a neo fascist uh, party, a right wing, right populist party with some members who are who are extremists, uh, entered the parliament on the federal level. We had, on the state level, even West Germany in the 80s, once the so-called Republic, Republicans, um, they disappeared again. We had the NPD in state, state, um, uh, state parliaments, which, which mostly disappeared. But now we have the AFD, and it looks like that the AFD, the so-called alternative for Germany, will uh, stay in politics. Um, that is new, indeed, and um, uh, it's a challenge for the democratic parties, but obviously um, they were not able to convince all the um, uh, voters to, to pick one of the democratic parties, which have a range from the conservative or the kind of conservative CDU to the left party, the post-communists uh, from East Germany, who are more social democratic than they, than they were in the past. Um, this party actually started as, a, as an anti-Euro party. It was not a right extremist party or a right populist party. It was an anti-Euro. They, they, they challenged the, 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 the vice decision to have a Euro in Germany. and. Uh, what it means for the um, for the economies of the of the member states. However, we have them now, and now it's a real right wing party, populist, against migration. Um, that's their main topic. They don't have many other topics. It's always migration, which is responsible for the problems in this country, from uh, from um, um, from unemployment to. Uh, Social to, to, to criminality, etc. Uh, the good thing is, they had 13% um, uh, in the last uh, national election in 2014. They had 11% on the national level um, uh, last May uh, for the European um, election. And this was some relief. Many people had expected that the uh, right-wing, right extre extremist parties could gain so much that they are a real, real threat for the European Parliament. They still have 25% in general. In some countries, they are Italy or Poland, they are or Hungary, they are very strong majority. Um, but in general, on the European level, um, it's not a rise, and in Germany, also not, at least on a national level. We see a phenomenon that 30 years after the wall came down, we have a very divided uh, country uh, regarding the political affiliation of the voters. In East Germany, particularly in the region where I grew up, in the southeast of Saxony, but also in Thuringia and Brandenburg, uh, the AfD is the strongest party. They don't have power because we have a um, uh, um, Verhältniswahlrecht. Um, you, how do you call Verhältniswahlrecht? Um, so, uh, in the US, the winner takes all. You have either a Republican or a, a Democratic uh, president and administration. In Germany, uh, you get a share you, you got as a party. It's a proportional voting system. Mm -hmm. And so even though um, the, the, the AFD is the strongest party with a third of the votes, the other two thirds of the votes go to other parties. And that's why in Germany you always have to build coalitions. In the moment it's the CDU and the SPD in, in, on the federal level, but you can also have the CDU with the liberals or the Social Democrats with the Greens, or the CDU even with the Greens in Hessen. And this is also a good thing for the political atmosphere. One legislature, 
um, this is your political opponent, next four years it could be your partner. And that also shapes the way you act with each other. I come from the AFD to this, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not, you, 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 you stop me. So, but the AFD in East Germany is uh, strong for several reasons. Um, there, first of all, 40 years of communism um, changed the society dramatically. The whole societal fabric changed. So um, before Hitler came to power, we had a democracy in Germany. We had the Weimar Republic. We had so we had a social democratic president. We had parties. We had unions. We had uh, we had organizations who organized the society, which were rebuilt um, in West Germany with the help of the Americans after uh, after the Second World War, and in East Germany, the opposite. Yes, we had in East Germany even a Christian Democratic Party, a Liberal Democratic Party, a National Democratic Party, but they were all satellites of the Communist Party who ruled the whole country. So there was no free party, there was no free organization of, uh, of civil society, nothing. And the only part of the society which was kind of free and a, a safe haven for people who saw different were the churches. But when you were engaged with the church, you paid a high price, like me. I wasn't even allowed to go to high school for the reason that my father was a Protestant minister. So all these organizations which shape a society, a community, were, were gone. There were no parties, there were, the churches were diminished, people went weren't willing to pay this high price to join the church. So, and in this way, um, the society didn't regenerate. So we don't have strong parties. Um, we don't have strong churches. We, uh, we don't have these organizations which um, look for the societal needs. And that leads people to look for alternatives, for easy solutions, plus, they experienced, experienced many losses also. They, they gained freedom, but of course they, they experienced losses after the war came down. The whole economy broke down. The young people left. So when, when I left school, my, 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 my classmates went for apprenticeship in the coal mine, in the power plant, in the textile industry, in the car manufacturer. The coal mine is a big lake now. The mm -hmm. power plant was uh, um, demolished in the early 90s. It was, it was not economically um, reasonable to, to keep it, but it was gone. Textile industry was gone in, 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 in a heartbeat, and, and, and car manufacturing is history since 91. So of course, they went to a deep valley in a way. And, East Germany is much better off as, as many, many parts of East, Eastern Europe, but that shaped also the people and this gave them the feeling we are forgotten and we, we don't, uh, can, can take part, in the, part in, the, in, the, in the wealth of this country and they look to Bavaria where the people are better off and they don't look to Poland 10 kilometers to the east. They came from the from the same economic situation, and now they are so much better off than the Polish neighbors who didn't have the resources Germany had, has to, to, to rebuild East Germany. However, this is this feeling we are forgotten. And then there come politicians who tell them, do you know why you don't have the money from Bavaria or from Baden-Württemberg? Do you know why you, the young people are leaving? Because all the money, uh, uh, which you are entitled to is going to the migrants who, who came in the millions. So that's how the situation is. It doesn't, that doesn't um, 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 entschuldigen, excuse um, uh, this political voting, but it explains it. Isn't so. it the same story all over the world, even in this country? You find a scapegoat for the problems that exist, and 
But I mean, there was one other quick thing that you wanted answered. Yeah. We'll do that one quick thing, I, and then we'll have to cut it I, off. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I really can teach you um, how to organize a reconciliation. The first thing and the most important thing is transparency. When we, when we, um, I was the yeah, I was the the head of the Citizens Committee, which took over the Stasi headquarters in Berlin in January 1990. And we had a long discussion what to do with the files. Um, we went in because uh, we said, first of all, the Stasi should stop its work. Second of all, they shouldn't destroy their evidence. But then we discussed, should we really open these files? shouldn't we uh, destroy them? That's so much societal um, dynamite. It's so, so dangerous when, when one person knows who spied on them, who destroyed his or her career, etc., etc. This will, this will disrupt the society. This was the discussion we had in early 1990, by the way, together with Stasi officers and generals, so they tried to influence us. Um, and then we we didn't destroy the files. Parts were destroyed, but that's another question, but not, not really. Uh, but we were not sure what to do and what made clear that we need these files and transparency was the first and only free election we had in East Germany in March 1990. There was this one person, a former lawyer, very involved in the churches, very active, um, uh, seen already at the new prime minister of, of, of uh, East Germany. And um, then there was this, this, this Gerücht, this the, rumor. the rumor that he might have um, uh, worked together with the Stasi as an informant. And we said, okay, we don't want to have former Stasi uh, informants in the highest office of our country, people who influenced um, um, uh, biographies who maybe helped to put people in, in jail, whatever, and we said, okay, let's, let's look it up. Hmm. And indeed, he was not only a spy, he was installed by the Stasi from the beginning on. And that made very clear um, we really have to face the, the, the reality also in the interest of the victims. We can't just just cover it up and uh, go on. We have to uh, um, provide transparency. And so the, the files were used for um, checks of politicians and civil servants. Uh, it was not a criminal investigation. It was more an act of political hygiene to say, no, those people who influenced, who, who, who destroyed biographies, who, who, who cooperated with this regime, shouldn't be in political office again. Mm. And um, yeah, it was maybe in a way also a lecture we, we got already from the experience of Germany after the Second World War. I'm very sure that, uh, no, no, we discussed it also that um, we should start immediately um, uh, with this process of not so much reconciliation, but transparency and openness. And so, uh, yeah, transparency is one thing. And, and there's no other um, Eastern European country which did it immediately. Many of them came later with this issue. And many of them told us we should have done it immediately. We should have invested for a new beginning also. Well, with that, I'm afraid I have to cut it off, but please join me in thanking. We can talk all night. Thanking Council General David Gill and Heiko. Before we leave, please, we have presentations to make. Everyone knows who are doing the presentations, so come up now to do your presentations. And as they're coming up, I would ask my board members to stand so that I, we can all thank you for the work that you're doing with the World Affairs Council of Harrisburg, Kalpana. Thank you all. Thank you for being a pride. Lindsay, very good. Would you come up now and, and do the presentations? Link, Council General.
Oh, presentation for yes, me. Yes. Yes. I, I saw it as an next presentation. <laughs> I know you lived in Philadelphia briefly. Uh, you weren't able to be a Temple Owl. No. But uh, here's your Temple Owl. <laughs> thank you, wonderful. <laughs> well, thank, thank you very much. so much. Thank you. Wow. That's cool. Have something. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I forgot to give you <laughs> It's just something really small for, for both you and for Heiko. Oh, that's very nice. For a rainy Thank day. For a rainy day. For a rainy day. Thank you. <laughs> Elias. Thank you, Tina. <laughs> You're oh, rich, you wow. see? <laughs> it's Christmas. Yes. We have something for you from the World Affairs yeah. Council and a little bit for Heiko. So thank you so Heiko, much. Heiko, you have a, a little gift and here. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> so hopefully you enjoyed your visit. I know. Thank you. That's oh, beautiful. Wow. I know Thank, I read you, it. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Great pleasure. Okay, we should we should go. Huh? Ah, you're all right. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks, Joe. But before we leave, one more thing. I want my interns to stand up, the new ones as well as the old ones, to stand up. This is what we're doing this summer. We want you to know who are your next world leaders. So please stand, Sophia, Alex, our new interns who will be starting soon, Katie, Zogia. Are there any other, where is, there? Yeah, there is Alex Dentremont. And we have, ah oh yes, very good. So we have a full house that we will be, um, and if any of you have I expertise you'd like to share, they're learning about world religions, okay? We need you to come and speak to them. We'll slot in the time. And of course, Elise is gonna to talk to them about phone etiquette and business etiquette. If you have expertise to share with our interns, please let us know. We want you to come in. They, they are in the office from 10 to 4, Monday through Thursday. And they are organizing the International Young Leaders Conference and Career Fair. That will be the first week in August at Harrisburg University. So with that, please thank you again and once again, thank you for taking the time. Wunderbar together. <laughs>